So um, I could have never imagined that I would be in a place where I could have something to give to a community like yours. And although I know I play some kind of part in this dialogue, it still greatly humbles me that God would let me do it because I see you as some of his most precious children. So that he would let me talk to you. And I, you know, as I said, I, I know how small I am, but that he would let me talk to you, it's, uh, it humbles me. So 12 years ago, oh, thank you, whoever did that. 12 years ago, I would have never even walked in those doors. Um, and if I had walked in those doors, I mean, there's be no if about it, I wouldn't have walked in those doors. And the reason I wouldn't have is because I have been for about 30 years an evangelical Christian. I was raised Roman Catholic. But because I'm an evangelical Christian, but you can also fill in that spot, Nazarene, Assemblies of God, uh, Church of God, uh, Southern Baptist, because I'm one of that group, that's my co cohort group, because I'm one of that group, I know the truth, capital T. And the capital T truth said, you didn't exist. You know, there was a deception about this that you couldn't be both gay and Christian. So I wouldn't have come just for the simple fact that to have walked in these doors would have made me a heretic. So I believed what I was told about the issues of sexual orientation, but I wouldn't have even used the word sexual orientation. I would have used the word sexual preference. And it's not that I knew any Greek or Hebrew. Um, <laughs> And, I'm, you know, for my detractors that say, she never went to seminary, you're right, I went to engineering school. So, I, I mean, the only Greek I know are like symbols that you use in science. <laughs> and I'm darn good at a Greek restaurant because I understand the menu. <laughs> I mean, those are practical things, though, right? Um, I'm writing a book right now. It's probably called Walking the Bridgeless Canyon, and I promise people there will be not one Greek word in it. Not one. And uh, no Greek symbols, no Greek words, because I'm talking to the middle of the church. And as far as Hebrew, I grew up in New York City, a lot of Jews around. The town I went to high school in was probably 40% Jewish. So that's my extent of Hebrew. I've been to bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, and there you go. I mean, I understand myself, I, under you know, I understand the words I'm supposed to understand, but I'm not an expert. But I have gifts that God gave me to see and to love, and so, I'm called, and I'll, take, and I'll take that. But I was fairly sure that uh, people had their sexual preferences, and I still remember uh, my used-to-be best friends who sort of abandoned me. Um, we would meet together every Friday for years, for decades, and have breakfast together. And I still remember as we sat at that table in hushed tones, and we talked about Leanne, and Leanne was in the church choir. And Leanne had double knee surgery. And uh, she went to a woman's house that took care of her while she recuperated. And the woman was a lesbian. And the lesbian recruited Leanne. We knew, because now Leanne wasn't coming to church. And she was hanging out with the lesbian. And so we knew that Leanne, in her moment of weakness, truly, had been recruited by this lesbian, and that's what we talked about. So did we help Leanne? Did we help her in her recovery? Did we take meals to her so that she didn't have to stay with the recruiting lesbian? No. <laughs> we gossiped about her, because that's godly. So that's what I remember. I mean, I so remember doing that stuff. I knew nothing about gender or sex, or sexual orientation, or gender identity, or gender expressions. I had no idea what the difference between sex and gender was. I could still use the words, and a lot of people do. And I, we'll get to it with a story. But, um, you know, you'd go to a baby shower, because in Christian groups of homeschooling moms and mothers of preschoolers, which I led at my church, I mean, I've, I'm a pedigreed evangelical Christian. I led all those things. I founded all those things. I did junior high Bible studies. But I could say, you know, when someone was having a baby and they went for the test, you know, what gender is your baby? That's like the wrong question to ask. We can only tell the baby's sex because sex and gender are different. But we'll get to that. I mean, assume most of you know that, but, you know, we, that's, but I had no understanding of any of that. I, um, 
my views about normal and abnormal were pretty strict. I thought um, distinctly a male and female, and that's what marriage was about. It was about part A and to slot B, and that's the way it worked. And anything other than that was abnormal and, of course, perverted. Are you telling me, like, whatever, girl? Amen. A oh, amen. I mean, that's what I thought. I mean, that's the only way I knew. And believe me, from the background I came from, I knew it well. I've got my own nasty story, but that's probably why I can do this. Um, <laughs> it's not nasty anymore. I live a pretty wholesome and pure life. I really do. Um, I understood, so all of my, my divisions, all my binaries were pink and blue and male and female and female, you know, and masculine and feminine. Feminine. I knew nothing about the histor historical struggles of the LGBT community. I knew nothing. I cared nothing about it. As a matter of fact, uh, I lived in New York City when Stonewall happened. Um, you probably think I was a small infant, but I was 13 when Stonewall happened. And uh, never heard about it, never cared about it. It wouldn't have made a blip in my, in my world. Ed Koch was mayor around then. Um, I asked my mother a few months ago, did we know Ed Koch was gay? I mean, did we even know that kind of stuff? My mother said everybody knew he was gay, but nobody said anything about it. So, because he was a you know, 40, 50 year old bachelor, so everybody knew that, but nobody talked about it. And uh, so what's going on outside in Long Beach today, Long Beach Pride, is reminiscent of Stonewall. And I'll say something about that later, but um, if I could, <laughs> and the reason I want to say something about Stonewall is because of the tape, in context though, because if I could have, you know, the classic, if I could get $10, because it's no longer a dollar, you know, if I could get $10 for every time that somebody said, well, there ought to be a heterosexual pride parade. I mean, we don't have a heterosexual pride parade. Because people have no understanding what gay pride is about. They have no understanding what it's about. So I was in that group too. I had no understanding either. So the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community, community has endured, and some haven't endured, a lot of injustices and a lot of unfairnesses. Um, and it's not just from the Bible. It's from a cultural lack of understanding of who you are, a lack of understanding your history, a lack of understanding in science, and a misuse of the Bible. So it's all of those things. So, um, so if we're going to try to unravel that, unravel the abuses and the injustices against you, we're going to have to look at more things like that, more things outside of just the Bible. So I'm hoping, I'm, I'm probably going to say some, unusual, some things that you probably haven't heard before, and I hope I do. So back to 12 years ago, I think I was the, the exact representation of the religious every man sitting in the pews. Um, I think I'm, who I was 12 years ago is still the person sitting in the pews in the middle of the church, which is why I feel like I can talk to that position because I know it so well. And then, a um, story a lot of people have heard, then on a hiking trail I ran into a agnostic, Native American, Hispanic last name, um, lesbian. And started hiking with her because uh, she could keep the same pace. Um, I may not look it, like it, but I'm a darn good hiker. Take any of you to the top of the mountain and leave you there if you're not nice. <laughs> and so, uh, so Neto could keep pace with me. But having her in my life challenged a lot of my thinking. And it was the right time for me, and we talked about this on Friday night. I was at a low point in my life because my marriage of 20 years was falling apart. And I say this, I mean, and I really mean it. If you can find a Christian in crisis who's not particularly nice, that is the time to get them. Because their entire world is not working. A doesn't lead to B, doesn't lead to C. You've got people in crisis and they're willing to listen to you. I mean, I get mail like this all the time. People that uh, don't know what to do with their gay siblings and all of a sudden they go through a divorce and their life isn't working and they, there's, you know, their criticism and judgment on their gay siblings starts to melt away and they're ready to start listening to something different. I get a lot of that. I mean, it's surprising how much that kind of situation 
really does snag people. So until then, though, even though I knew a lot of lesbians, I was hanging out with a lot of lesbians. They were taking me on their camping trips, and I was the one that would bring the cupcakes while they fixed the generators and hooked up the triple trailers. <laughs> it's true. Yep, and it's really true. <laughs> it's sadly true. <laughs> they say, aren't you going to get a dirt bike? I'm like, no. I mean, why would I get a dirt bike? Do I look like a dirt bike girl? <laughs> Forget that. So I just go and play with their toys. But, um, You know, I just, <laughs> it's true. So, um, but because my marriage was cram crumbling and I got to meet all these different people, I wasn't willing to, I wasn't able to do what I had always done. What I had always done was told, <laughs> I wouldn't tell you you were wrong, but I would tell you why I was right, and I would invite you into my wonderfulness. But then when my wonderfulness went away, there was nothing I could invite you into, and I was just hurting too. So for f about five years, my very able to speak mouth was shut in telling people what to do, as I just did relationship. And when I was finally confronted in 2007 at a Gay Christian Network conference with gay Christians, and that devastated me <laughs> to see all of this going on, um, I was faced with a choice. And the choice is the choice that most Christians see that they have, and the, the choice that they have is, I can either, um, well, I can either love you and not read this book anymore, or I could love this book and still judge you. But I couldn't do both at the same time. I mean, that's what most of us believe, until I figured out that there might be a third way. <laughs> what a novel idea. <laughs> that I could love you and revisit this book and try to look at the scriptures in context of the relationships that I was gaining. Very, very important. I only know, right? I only know one person out of the thousands that I know that actually came to affirming theology through the scriptures. Almost everybody I know has done it with input of relationship. Right. So that tells you how important relationship is. And the problem with the church right now is they can't see the third way. So they just, they're coming slowly to that point, but it's very difficult to see that, do relationship with you and revisit the scriptures. Resources are coming out now, but it's, it's a challenge because the, the majority of the church takes a very traditional reading of the scriptures. And if there's something I can suggest to you that you use in terms of language, I mean, we've got to change the language in how we have this conversation. Um, there's a traditional reading of the scriptures, and some people want to look at the scriptures and say, well, here's the revisionist. Well, that terminology kind of bothers me. So what I've chosen to, to use in my everyday language is a more accurate reading of the scriptures. Change your own language. Just start planting those seeds in people's heads because I'm sure your pastor has done a lot of work with you on what these seven scriptures mean. And there is a far more accurate reading of them than the traditional church, the traditional reading is. So just to start to, to, start to change the language in that. Um, but I know that it's not just scripture that's tripping people up. I mean, when a, a really well-respected man in my own, I go to a non-affirming church, and I think it's really important that I stay there. And uh, so when an educated man with a PhD who works with a lot of groups, helping them plan and understand other people, so he's pretty good at communication, can still, when I have a conversation with him, and he can still tell me why gay people shouldn't be anywhere near around children, you know, whether it be in the church back room or in the Boy Scouts. Um, that's, you know, this book, this book did not tell him that, right? This book didn't tell him that you shouldn't be around children. The culture told him that. And when I can go to a church and try to stand up for, uh, stand up against ex-gay therapy for the children of that church, and as soon as I stand up to make a statement about that, they can rush me out of there because they don't want to hear what I have to say. 
um, and five men, five grown men can bodily escort me out of a church sanctuary. What a scene, right? I'm quite a woman. <laughs> quite a woman. Um, <clears throat> they didn't learn that from this book either. They didn't learn battery and assault from this book. So something else is going on. Something else is going on. So that's the, the something else is what I want to talk about, how we got here. So um, we form our beliefs, all of us form our beliefs on, uh, we don't just form them out of what we read in the Bible. We form them from experiences we have in life and experiences we have with God and with our own ability to reason and to uh, our own gifts, gifts of understanding. And we all have different degrees of that. And so I'm not going to, you can go and read anywhere the, uh, the less educated that you are, the more intolerant you are to diversity. That's, it's a truth. <clears throat> so we all have different abilities to reason and to, uh, to think things through. And then there's the traditions and the teachings we each come from. And then our, there's our personal, our personal reading of scripture. So we all come to this end point of theology or what we believe about something through this process. And when someone says you've got a wrong belief about a process, they're ignoring the fact that there's all these other steps that go there. So if I try to talk to somebody just about scripture, I'm ignoring all those other steps too. So what I hope to give you are some other tools. Um, I could do a day long on this, but I don't have a day long. <laughs> um, of how to look at those other areas. But culturally, I'll bet there's a lot of things that you don't understand that have uh, discriminations and prejudices and oppressions that have come against this community culturally. And it's a really interesting history. Uh, we, we, um, we have different ideas, well, to backtrack a little bit, we have different ideas about theology because our experiences are so different, because our understanding is so different. I mean, if we all, if the capital truth, T, the capital T truth were so obvious to all of us, there wouldn't be 31,000 denominations of Christians throughout the world, right? We can't agree to sprinkle or dunk, to rip the bread off, or when it comes to you, you can't touch it. I mean, we can't get, agree on even the most basic of things, so trying to agree about you is very difficult <laughs> and very polarizing, right? It's very difficult, oh my gosh. So, so we don't, we've, arriv we've arrived at our understanding about you, not with just the Bible. So we culturally, we have a long history of a lack of understanding about sex and gender, as I said, gender expression, gender identity, and I would challenge even some of you GLB people in this room that you don't have a really good understanding of gender identity. I'll bet there's a certain percentage of you that are not comfortable with the transgender community. And I know that's true, because I hang around enough with enough GLBs, and I have a huge heart for the T's, and I hear GLBs say some pretty dang insensitive things about the T's. So you need to understand some things about gender identity, too. Yeah, and, and about intersex people, and about biology, and about science, right? And so, if you don't understand it, and you're on the edge, my God. <laughs> People that I go to church with, they, can't, they still can't split the gender and sex thing, so gender identity is, it's a total stretch. So, how are we gonna unravel all these things? Because even in the last great movement in this country, Martin Luther King, when he got up to speak about civil rights of the black community, he didn't just talk about, he didn't talk scripture all the time. He talked history. He talked, I mean, there were still white people around that didn't see the intellectual richness, giftings of the black community. They had to, and that, that was all cultural, right? And so the white community had to be educated. And, and it's the same thing. The church has a certain cultural belief about the GLBT community. So we have to, we have to start to take some of all of that about, apart. And um, the last time I was here, I talked about a lot of this stuff, so this is the quick version. Uh, 
the word, there's a lot of details about it, watch the old video. The word homosexual didn't even appear until 1869 when a German, uh, Hungarian journalist coined the word because he saw this thing happening between men in the business he was in. He was a bookbinder, bookseller, journalist, and educated gay men showed up there. What a surprise. And uh, so he saw men falling in love with one another, and one man was rebuffed because he had been um, uh, the victim of extortion, and he committed suicide. And so the man, Bent, Bent Kenny, Burnt Kenny, who coined the word, he was, he was very distressed over the suicide of his friend. So when he tried to describe this behavior or this thing he was watching, he came up with the word homosexual, 1869. So how Paul in Rome in 55 AD when writing to the Romans knew that word homosexual is pretty amazing. I think, I mean, that's not possible, not possible. So <clears throat> next time we start seeing it is in medical journals in the late 1800s. And then it starts to appear slightly in terminology, doesn't arrive in the dictionary to 1909, homosexual. But still, nobody understood it as a sexual orientation, and the absolute way of understanding that is the word heterosexual didn't arrive in the dictionaries till 14 years later in 1923. So no one even understood what this thing that we understand so clearly as sexual, well, some of us understand so clearly as sexual orientation is, there wasn't even a word for it. There wasn't even a thought. So what was going on? You have to see what's going on in history then. Very interesting things were happening. And the best place to do case studies that people have done is New York City, because there were so many records of what was going on. And you can go back to historical newspaper records, arrest records, licensing records. You can just go back to records and pick up the history. But what was happening in the late 1800s uh, as people, so this is the history lesson, and I hope some of the things should go really wow and it'll make you laugh. Um, so as people started moving off the farms and into the cities for the industrial times that were happening, and immigrants were coming to this country, and uh, there ended up being a disproportionate number of men in cities than women. It was actually even called a bachelor culture. 40% of the people over 15 years old, I guess 15 was an appropriate marriage age to marry, and, uh, but 40% of the people, the men over 15 years old, were bachelors, which is really quite a big number. So we had immigrants coming in, people coming off the farm, and we had the First World War. And in a port city like New York, there were a lot of sailors arriving. So for the first time ever, there seemed to be a lot of intermixing uh, between men that never knew that this attraction was happening or could happen. So there were a lot of men getting together. And the studies are all sorry about men because, uh, I mean, the Bible doesn't even say in any, I mean, some versions of the Bible say nothing about what we think are lesbians. I mean, even, um, I mean, there's just, a, there's just no readings. Some people try to twist Romans 1, but uh, there's, there's plenty to say about that too. But, um, so we had men congregating in cities. So for the first time, all, also, they started building tenement buildings. So in tenement buildings, uh, people were packed in, and there were no kitchen facilities. And only one in 40 rooms in a ten tenement building had a bathroom. So the do-gooders, the moral crusaders, the Christian moral crusaders from the early 1900s said, you know, we've got to keep these immigrants. A lot of things are always about dirty immigrants. Um, that, was the, that was the concern at the time, the dirty immigrants. Um, so if there's only one in 40 rooms that have places to wash up, we've got to build bathhouses. You wonder where bathhouses came from? Christians built them. Praise God for Christians. <laughs> Yay, Christians. In 1915, there were 17 bathhouses in New York City. And they, were, they fell into three categories, the ones for um, the middle class, the ones for the working class, and then the Turkish and Roman ones, and eventually the ones near the village, Greenwich Village. Greenwich Village was a place where like proper people didn't go, and now 
the Greenwich Village is the place where all the cool people go. And, uh, but that was where, you know, it was kind of these single men kind of ghettoized. And so some of the bathhouses were there, and then they turned into places where men could beat each other, but Christians brought you the bathhouses. So, yay, huh? <laughs> Actually, we were at Pride yesterday, and we, I was having a contest. <laughs> Everything's a contest with me. I don't have to win, but it's a contest anyway. So we were standing as the people were coming in, and behind us were two dancers from a bathhouse. So nothing stops me from talking to anybody, so I talked to the boys from the bathhouse. So do you boys know where bathhouses came from? So, you know, so I taught them about bathhouses. They were like, really? And I said, so, you know, and I said, and also we're trying to get all the attention today because it's going to be like God versus the bathhouses. And God's going to win. We're going to win. So the little boy says, he says, but people need both things. They need God and sex. And I said, yeah, but God invented sex too. So we win. We totally win. <laughs> we win. He says, well, maybe you got something there. He's cute, but... I, I was smarter, because I, I knew the history of bathhouses. True story. So uh, also in the 19th century, so the 1800s, and a lot of people will read old records like presidential records, and I mean, you, you see these things pop up, you know, HuffPo has, wants to say something interesting one day, so they'll say, oh, um, Lincoln or Jefferson, they were gay men because look at these letters they wrote to each other, I fondly, you know, love you and miss you and those things. Bromances, that we would call them, were really common then. Really, really common. People, men didn't mind sharing um, affectionate language with one another. It was part of the culture. There were no stereotypes about that sort of behavior before, between men until, until there were stereotypes. So, um, men were finding themselves in lots of single-sex environments. And so they were starting to meet. And so everything was kind of cool during the 1900s, 10s, and 20s. It wasn't until the 30s, 40s, and 50s that we started stigmatizing these men because of who they were having sex with. But until that time, a man's uh, sexual identity and reputation was really defined by the gender of the person that he had sex with. So I'm sure your pastor has gone over with you the gender conversations about what was happening in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It was people taking on the gender of a female, that whole word effeminate. It's all about people taking on different genders. Through the course of history, the bad thing to be and to act like was a woman. And here I am, right? I mean, there was a point where Aristotle said at one point about women that they were men damaged in the womb. That's how we got women. And so, I mean, the church still has a problem with gender, which is why I think it's so funny that God put such a passionate voice about gender and sexual orientation to the conservative church in a woman. <laughs> you have no idea. I was talking to Eric this morning about it that the way I get treated by the conservative church and dismissed just because I'm a woman is very, very interesting. So this, ish, this, uh, this dialogue of gender it makes a great deal of sense to me. So it was all about the gender of the person that you chose as a sexual partner. And if the gender of the person was female and you were a normal male, because that's what you would have been called, you were fine. There was no stigma against you. There was a stigma against the ones that held the, the feminine gender, and they were called fairies. But they didn't necessarily dress in women's clothing. You could tell they were fairies because of the way they did their hair and their makeup and their behavior. So they were the ones looked down upon, but they were still not abominations. They were kind of seen with like a dismissive uh, amusement about them. But the men that had sex with them there was, not, there was no stigma against them because the sex, the relationship they were having was still with a female gender. <clears throat> so this is the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. So there were men having relationships with men, and there were no stigmas against that in the working class. 
there started to be a stigma against it in the middle class. Because the men in the middle class were perceived to have had more control over their sexual passions. And then also doctors, medical, psychological doctors started getting wind of this. <clears throat> and they had to start explaining things. And so they, in the early 30s, started describing those people that were having uh, sexual relationships with men. It wasn't about gender. They started talking about that, about them now, as being um, homosexual men, because now we have the word. Before that, they were just called trade. Men that had sex with fairies were called trade. And there, <coughs> the fairies were seen to be not perverts, but inverts, because they inverted their gender from male to female. So the terminology was all very different. Um, lots of words, it was acceptable, and you can tell that there was a a toleration within the working class for this mixing of fairies and trade men and normal men and what we would call heterosexual men that only had sex with women. Um, I bet sex has never been said so much on this stage. Well, maybe it has. I don't know. And who says it? It's like, you know, the heterosexual in a celibate relationship. There you go. It's just talking about sex all the time. And, um, <laughs> and so... Um, They started, they started um, then classifying people according to who the object of their relationship then started defining who they were as orientation. And, and as I said, there was a, a great deal of tolerance within the working class. And you could see this because all, you had, all people had to do was read the advertisements of the time. And there would be huge parties where there were drag queens and people from uptown, the normal men and the trade men and the heterosexual women, the, he the heterosexual men and the fairies all together in one place. And there was a great deal of integration with the social scene. So there was no um, disdain. There was no separation for sexual orientation because we were just starting to understand it. And that wasn't so much so in the middle class but certainly in the working class. And even when sailors would come back into port, there was no arrests or um, dismissiveness of the men that would go off with the fairies. At the time, it's just so funny with the, with the military um, publicity uh, propaganda machine, you know, what they were trying to accomplish was they were realizing that venereal diseases were ri on the rise. And so <clears throat> they started campaigns, advertising campaigns, and they kind of missed it. They needed a better PR person. And the advertising campaigns so strongly within the sailors' minds were that you could get venereal disease from female prostitutes. The message they were really trying to tell them was you need to use a condom but the pictures always showed female prostitutes. So there was this connection in the minds of the sailors that we could get venereal diseases only from women, so the safer option was the fairies. And it was very acceptable. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, it's just a part of the history. We don't understand and we don't know, but it's, it's, you can see it in all the records. <clears throat> so the bars were mixed. The hotels were mixed. Everything was mixed. So then, uh, welcome again to the social, moral, <laughs> Christian reformers. <clears throat> they always do odd things. I mean, they're still trying to do odd things, aren't they? Um, in the late 1800s, and then very much in the beginning of the 1900s, they looked at the problem of alcohol in this country. And again, it was the immigrants. It was, what are those immigrants doing when they're drunk? It's always about the others, the other groups. So by 1919, they finally passed prohibition. <clears throat> and this is important in your history, surprisingly important. And the 19th Amendment banned the, the sale, transportation, and manufacture of alcohol. And, but it didn't stop the sale of alcohol. Actually, the people that did the best parties still in the speakeasies was the trade men, the fairies, the drag queens, and uh, although they weren't supposed to legally operate, it, operate <coughs> in 1925, during the height of prohibition, 
there were between 25,000 and 100,000 speakeasies, speakeasies in New York City alone. So prohibition wasn't very effective, except it did make the Kennedys a lot of money. So that's, you know, we got the Kennedys out of that. And, uh, but, so when the, when prohibition was repealed in 1933, we still had to get some rules going. So you could only get a liquor license if you had orderly behavior in your bar. <clears throat> and by 1933, we had figured out that you gay people, you didn't behave orderly. So they decided, the state liquor agencies decided that they wouldn't issue liquor licenses to anybody that served homosexuals. They didn't quite say it that way, but they shut places down that served homosexuals. There was a bar in Albany that a couple of men in the bar were calling each other, the, the, the words of the day, very feminine words, because I mean, it's always been about gender until we made it about sex partners. Um, the men were saying things to each other, the, the words they would say to one another, the words of the day were buttercup and pansy and da daisies and nances and she-men, always feminine terms. And so two men were in a bar and they were having an exchange and calling each other feminine names and had feminine, effeminate uh, behavior between them one another and the bar was closed down because of the disorderly conduct going on there and the homosexuals in there. So it became difficult for homosexuals because that's what we now called this group of people because now it was about who you had sex with, not the gender, the sex of the person. Um, bars were closed down when they started serving gay people. So that caused, in the mid-30s, for the next 25 to 30 years, the gay community to now desegregate into their own gay ghettos and bars <clears throat> and operate and go to illegal bars because the bars were paid off, the bars were run by the mafia, a lot of payoffs going on, bars closed down quickly and moved around. So. From the 20s when you were the height of all the parties to now the late 30s where you weren't even allowed in the bars with people. So culturally, you were pushed aside. Doctors started talking about the mental illness where they never talked about that before. All this stuff started happening in the 30s. So what would that be, two generations ago? Two generations ago, you weren't a problem. But then all of a sudden you became a problem. I mean, we were talking, everybody always needs an enemy. You know, you became the enemy. <clears throat> so that interesting dynamic was starting to happen and it was compounded. I mean, these things may sound odd, but I bet you've just never heard them before. I read a lot. And it was compounded by the fact that women started entering into the workforce too and competing with men for jobs during the First World War. Women started then moving into the cities and there was a, that is when the shift of men having these bromances was looked upon badly because now men had to prove that they were more manly as opposed to women. So all kinds of things were created. That's the beginning of the Boy Scouts because we had to teach our boys to become more manly. Women were trying to get the, the votes, their right to vote. So all of these gender differences started to split and men were expected to become more manly. So when men were expected to become more manly, that whole fairy culture, that whole homosexual culture, became a problem. Prohibition made it a problem. All of these things were all happening at the same time. Um, men did funny things during that time too. It, it, there's a, and you can trace it back, the whole boxing craze that was going on. You know, it, the set up boxing rings in different cities, it was all about showing how masculine men were. Just we had to show, men had to show how masculine they were. So, um, also during this time, uh, another piece of the social and social and moral reformers, they were caring about all these young men coming into the cities and living in tenement houses and not having places where their morals were protected. So by 1920 in New York City, they had built seven YMCAs, which became gay central, you know, like, it wasn't YMCA, why am I so gay? I mean, that's what they became. <laughs> but that's what was happening, and men weren't allowed to bring women back to their rooms, but 
Nobody was kind of getting this other thing that was going on. <laughs> and you just say, Christians, thank you for the bathhouses. Thank you for the wise. Thank you for prohibition. This is funny. Um, and so we spend a lot of time ghettoizing you. And now we don't know you anymore. We've shoved you off to the side and we don't know you anymore. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen this video passes around every once in a while on YouTube from 1967, the Mike Wallace CBS show. I forget what it was called. But you know, and there's the homosexual. Johnny is playing ball. He's just finished playing ball. And the homosexual drives up and says, Johnny, you want a Coke? And Johnny, gets, Johnny shouldn't get in the car with him. And Johnny goes. And then finally, the homosexual gets him. You know, And it was an hour-long show. And before the time of streaming and YouTube and revisiting these shows, 20% of the American population saw that show that night on a Sunday. And the show is repulsive. It's just a repulsive show. I have an original copy of the 1971 edition, too, of Everything You Want to Know About Sex. And the chapter in there on male homosexuality, I bring it out at dinner parties because it's so funny. It is hysterical. Um, I, I, I've had people bent over laughing. with They couldn't even speak anymore reading some sentences out of there. But 150 million people read that book in the 10 years it came out. And that chapter on homosexuality, and it was written by a doctor. So the culture was told all kinds of horrible things about you. Happened very, very quickly. Happened very quickly. So everybody started getting up, ganging up on the gays, so why not the religious people? <laughs> So in 1946 was the first time that the word homosexual appeared in the Bible, New Revised Standard Bible. And by 1968, most of the translations of the Bible no longer said effeminate or evildoers or male prostitutes. They all started saying homosexual. And the Catholics, I think, had the most interesting variation. The Catholics switched from, um, until 1968, in 1 Corinthians, um, it, the word said masturbators. And then um, that was no longer good. There were too many masturbators sitting in church or missing church. <laughs> I don't know. And so they changed the word to homosexual, because I guess smaller group of people, you want, you want the masturbators at church on Sunday. So I, you know, not here. Not here. <laughs> so that's the cultural layer. And there's an entire, there's other layers, but that's the one I wanted to concentrate on today. So once again, you know, how do, back to this, how do, how do people come to their conclusions? They don't come to their conclusions just through scripture. They come to their conclusions about their experiences, what their culture tells them, what their understanding is. So we got to this understanding um, probably rightly, right? I mean, these, these I, I didn't come up with the thoughts that, gay people shouldn't be around children and had a mental illness and it was a preference and they could choose these things on my own. My culture taught me these things. Because, so it's, it's, never, it's never one thing. So for the last 80 years, this has been built, building up. So it's not that scripture isn't imp is not important in this, but there's all these layers. It's just been compounded by scripture. And now we've made it very much about scripture in the church. So you have to understand that, but there's also a lack of science. Okay, so there's a lack of all these things. So how do we use all this information? You know, hopefully you're a tiny bit smarter about this today. I'm sure your pastor teaches you scripture. But we also know that so much of the church is responding completely inappropriately when trying to engage the gay community. We have forgotten all of the dictates of our faith about love and service, but we are operating in fear and ignorance of you because we just, don't, we just don't know you. We don't know you at all. And for what I was saying to Stanton yesterday and to the group, I mean, this, this stuff hurts me deeply. I mean, it never should have happened. It just never should have happened to you. You were just the people on the chopping block and the church picked you. But there's good things coming ahead for you too. And as we know, the Bible says not one word about long-term, committed, emotional, romantic relationships between same-sex loving people. The same rules that apply to heterosexual people apply to you. But it doesn't, it doesn't uh, target you out and say anything different about you. 
So what's being commemorated out here today, though, out in Long, in, in Long Beach Pride, is Stonewall. And that's what people don't understand. So now you understand the culture where everything was cool in the 20s, and then we took you in the 30s, we ghettoized you, we told lies about you, we were absolutely fear-filled about you, and now it's the late 60s and we've completely demonized you. And all kinds of rights protests are happening. The women are happening, uh, the uh, anti-war people, civil rights is happening, and the police go into Stonewall and they try to st shut Stonewall down. They usually had a habit of going in on like an off night, Thursday night, Sunday mornings, you know, when no one would be there, but this time they went in on a Friday night. And for the first time ever, gay people said no. No way, no more. We're not getting in your paddy wagons. We're not gonna do this. And a couple of days later, it was a lesbian that said, you know, everybody's having protest marches. Why don't we have a protest march? So they put in for a, a protest, a marching permit, and they were trying to get from 14, well, they were trying to get from the village. The village ends at 14th Street. They were trying to get to Central Park, which is 59th Street, Columbus Circle. And so they were just trying to get up to 59th Street. They never thought they'd make it. <clears throat> and they thought the original people, they put in for the permit, they were gonna march, and they thought they'd get stopped. And there was a huge risk for these people to march, huge. Because they could lose their jobs, and they could lose their apartment leases if somebody outed them as gay. <clears throat> so you think about the first people that marched in the first gay pride. They're very brave to do that. And they thought there might have been a couple of dozen of them. And when they first got there, there were about 200. And so they started marching up at a Christopher Street. And when they got to the edge of the village at 14th Street, there were 2,000 of them. The people from the sides came and joined them. And if you see the original pictures of it, they actually had signs that said gay pride. So that's, that's the history of what's going on out there. 80,000 people are out there. And the thing is, the youth don't know that, right? They don't even know why they're doing gay pride. The heterosexual people don't know it, but probably the youth don't know it. They don't know the price that was paid, but that is the original start of gay pride. So when people say to me, we don't have a heterosexual pride, I tell them the story, try to educate. And I say, we were never not free. <laughs> Us heterosexual people were never oppressed. So that, that's the history of it. So yesterday, uh, when uh, Alan and June and I were driving past the entrance again, and there was that group of young kids, oh my gosh, they couldn't have been 16, 17? And just to watch them in their rainbow regalia, uh, walking so happily and freely, and you both said, I mean, that would have never happened when you were young. And things have changed. I mean, it's not 1969 anymore, but you're still oppressed. You're still oppressed. And your number one oppressors now are Christians. It's, it's uh, we're doing it. So during this time of oppression, the church has been extremely complicit in, shame, in uh, sending you shaming and rejection messages. And uh, so what, that's what we were doing yesterday. So James and Stanton, and Nolan, Rockstar Nolan. <laughs> Rockstar Nolan. And, uh, <laughs> and, and June and Alan, we were out there just trying to tell people because the shaming messages have been so strong that youth thinks when they come out now, they have to leave churches. So we were doing a lot of asking, like, have you been raised in the church? Are you still in a denomination? Are you hiding? I mean, there are all kinds of ways to have these conversations. A lot of people hiding in churches, and they think they can do that forever. A lot of pastors, kids, yesterday. It's like, this is God's funny trick on the entire Christian community. Isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, my goodness. It's, it's like if 10% of people are gay, it's like 25% of pastors, kids. 25% of pastors are going to have a gay kid. It's, just, it's amazing. So one girl walked up to me yesterday, and she, I said, uh, um, so what denomination are you from? She says, oh, my father's a pastor, and I just came out to him two days ago, and I'm just going to tell him. He just, he can't, not allowed to judge me. I said, honey, that may work today, but it ain't going to work as a long time, you know, plan on this thing. You're going to get badgered. <laughs> 
can we talk about what you're going to do? And then other people, can we talk about what you do when you walk into your Catholic church and they're okay with you now and you walk in holding the hand of your boyfriend? It's going to be a crisis. Can we talk about at that point you're going to have to make a decision to go to some kind of an affirming church? Don't walk out of church. Can we, can we talk about the plan? So I want those people to stay in churches. First of all, I don't want them to go off into their destructive behaviors. But the truth is, I don't want to lose you people. I don't want to leave, lose the richness that you, the richness and the diversity and the giftings you bring to the church. I mean, would there be any Christmas pageants left? Would there be any? <laughs> Every time I go into a, into a, I mean, the big ones, the big mega churches, how many of my gay male friends have done those Christmas pageants for years? I mean, a homeschooling mom cannot replace a gay man. No. It's just, it's not even a possibility. So we all lose. So, um, so you, you have to, you have to learn. You have to learn not just scripture, because that's not going to work. You have to learn some of your own culture. You have to have the confidence to know that this was done to you and it was inappropriate. You have to just stand in a little bit more confidence with us. And you also have to have patience with us because we don't know any of this. And I'm doing my best to educate. But um, you, you just have to be patient. We have to be patient with you. And there are people, there are people from my tribe and your tribe that are trying to have this conversation in this very desolate plane in the middle. And this patient, this conversation has to look like a Jesus conversation. It has to be guided in love and grace and compassion from both sides. So um, I have the confidence to believe that you'll do a better job at, us, at it than us. And the reason is, is because you've learned better what grace and compassion look like. <laughs> I've learned it because I've hung out with you. So I've learned it from you. So thank you for that. Because I, I mean, I can't imagine what this personality without grace and compassion would look like. You want me on your team because I am so driven that without compassion and grace, I'd probably, oh, I could, I guess, be the person we were talking about in the beginning with the lipstick, right? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I didn't say that, see? So, because um, you know everything that's been told about you is a lie. So now you're, you've heard a little bit more of the culture. You know that's a, uh, it's a lie. So. Jesus didn't come, we know this, to look at the outsides. So when people start judging you on the behavior on the outside, you're going to have to start talking about your changed spirits and your changed hearts and your changed lives. Because Jesus never came for the outside, right? He came for the inside. And I don't care, right? I don't care what, I do care what your behavior is. But the problem is, when I was confronted with you, and I was judging you on the outside, and the spirit started talking to me about your insides, that's when I had a problem. That's when I had to deal with something. So that's when a lot of us are going to have to deal with it. So this, it's really interesting. I think the reason my life is, is uh, I get to have cool things happen to me is because God's always talking to me, and always. Uh, it's always walking, and I, and I have this thing in my head, and I was just thinking about this when I was coming over, that I, I think that the only place he talks to me is when I have hiking boots on, and I'm on dirt, and there's trees around me, and there's dogs running beside me. But really, all I have to do is walk, because then I'm not distracted somehow. And yesterday, you may have read this on Facebook. I'm a big fan of Facebook. But a really interesting thing happened yesterday. And I was out for my morning walk. And I'd finished talking to my friend on the phone. And I was headed over to Pride so that I could um, walk inside of Pride and pray for that event and for the people that were going there. And because part of my personality is I get what I want, I knew I could coerce somebody into letting me in the gates. I mean, that's not a problem. Born in New York, I know that. I mean, all I have to do, you can't believe the places I've gotten into. <laughs> I just keep talking and talking and like, eh. So I figured if I told this, well, I finally came across a person at an emergency exit who was working for the security company. 
And I figured if I told her what I was doing, she would love what I was doing, and she would let me in those gates, you know, to pray for people, because she'd be all on board about that. So I was going to manipulate her. <laughs> I've got to find a better word. Encourage her. <laughs> give her insight into my godliness. That's what I was going to do. I was going to give her insight into my godliness. So I walked up to her. And she was, I was trying to have a conversation with her, and she kept lifting this heavy gate and dragging it across this very uneven pavement, and it just lifting it and dragging it. And you know, those people coming in and out of the emergency exit that should have been there were interrupting my conversation with her. And so I, and I made an assumption about her. I said to her, um, do you, but you know, I, I figured she was approving. So I said to her, do you, um, do you identify as lesbian or straight? And she said, uh, straight. I said, well, what denominational background are you from? And she said, I'm the daughter of a Pentecostal preacher. And uh, my dad was a pastor for 30 years, and he died last year. And I've lived right next to the church my whole life. And I said, so where are you on this issue? And she said, now she had already heard how fabulous I am, right? Because I convinced her so I could get in the gate. So I never got in the gate, by the way. <laughs> That's not what ended up being important. I mean. It was just me trying to get in the gate, but that was my intention. This was never God's intention, but it was, it was like, okay, Kathy, I'm going to let you play your normal game, you know. And uh, so we started talking, and she said, well, I believe that marriage is kind of the way God said it is in the Bible. You know, one man can be with one woman. So I asked her, was she open to another conversation about that? And she said yes. So in that conversation, we talked about loneliness and why Adam, why Eve was created for Adam. And then uh, she said, well, that's interesting. I mean, that was seven or eight minute conversation. And then I said, any other objections? And she said, well, you know what Paul said in Romans. So that was a whole conversation then about sex and gender, sex is in your pants and gender's in your head. And, I, and then I talked about intersex people. I mean, I can pack in a lot in a little conversation with the door opening and closing and following her with the gate and following her back with the gate and her lifting the gate. and. Uh, so I said to her, um, oh, and the important part of this is on the way over there, while I was walking, I happened to notice, there's no happened in any of my life, I happened to notice a work glove on the ground. How random is that? So I happened to notice this work glove, and I kept walking. I didn't even remember where I saw it. And uh, kept walking, and so she's opening the gate and closing the gate, and she actually says, I should have brought gloves today. Um, I, you know, I didn't know this is where they were going to position me. I should have brought gloves. So, you know, I'm walking back to the gate with her, just walking back and forth and explaining to her sex and gender and telling her about intersex people and how I might have a 47th chromosome and I, was, I might have on my birth certificate, it might have said male, and who knows? I mean, could she really tell if maybe I looked like I did but could have had a penis in my pants? And, you know, it's probably way too much for her. But I was just challenging her thinking. <laughs> probably it's like daughter of a Pentecostal preacher, like, oh my God, I met a woman with a penis. <laughs> no. So, but I was just challenging her thinking, and I said, now if God created that person, who are you to say that that's not the person God created? So I said to her, all day long today, honey, you are going to see people walking back and forth in front of you, and you're going to not know how God created them. You're not going to understand how God had created them. And I said, but you're the daughter of a Pentecostal preacher. You know what God says. I'm going to challenge you. Can you look at these people with the eyes of, of, of Jesus? Can you try to do that today and just look at this group with the eyes of Jesus? Yeah, I think I can do that. So Teresa and I hugged one another, and I took off, and I thought, the girl needs a glove. Where the heck did I see that glove? And I thought, I don't even remember where I saw that glove. So I start tracing my way back the way I got there and following the route that I got, you know, that I had walked along Pride Route. And it was actually where I had illegally crossed the street. Surprising, you know, I'm a New York City person, I'm a jaywalker. So it's the way we are. So I had illegally crossed, not in a crosswalk, and I had been walking along where there was no shoulder, oh, no surprise again. And that's where the glove had been that I'd seen. When I did my illegal jaywalking, that's where the glove had been. And I'm walking back, and I'm thinking, 
God, could you do me a favor and could that glove be right-handed and clean? That'd be nice. I have a great story about bug spray, too, in the middle of the desert once when I was praying and wanted to leave because the mosquitoes were eating me alive, and I thought, I should have brought bug spray. And in the middle of the Arizona desert, let me tell you, there was not a person there. I walked around a bend, and there was a bottle of off spray in the road. Weird stuff. I mean, it, weird stuff. So I kind of figured that that glove would be right-handed and clean. That's just the way I figured it. So I got back and I picked the, I, the glove was there. It's like, it wasn't where I thought it was. Here it is. So there it is. I pick up the glove. I put it on my hand. I take a picture for Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> so I bring the glove back and I walk up to Teresa with the glove like this. I have the glove on my hand and I'm walking like this, smile it up to her. She sees that thing and she starts smiling. And she said, you brought me a glove. I said, the glove was in the street. I tell her the story about the glove and she's like, and I said, you know, honey, who gave you this glove? You know who gave you this glove, right? So she said, yeah, I know who gave me that glove. So I said, sweetie, he cares about everything about you. He cares about your protection. He cares about the littlest details about you. Do you think you could take how he feels about you and apply it to the people you're looking at today? Yes. Do you think? You can look at those people with the same kind of love and protection and um, supply that God gives to you. And that made a huge, that one silly glove made a difference because what she saw in that was also that somehow God was using this crazy lady that was trying to bully her way <laughs> into the gate. I mean, she probably knew what I was doing, but I saw her turn away people that didn't have their orange volunteer bands. I mean, she was pretty, she was a gate Nazi. <laughs> But I probably still could have gotten in if I didn't get distracted by God. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> oh, yeah, hang out with me. Hang out with me. So, so I'm, I was trying to encourage her to look at people with the eyes of God, and I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. As you go into these conversations with us people, we people who are oppressing you, try to look at us with the eyes of God, too. We do not understand. I'm telling you this. We don't get it. We don't understand sex, gender, gender identity, gender expression, the 47th chromosome of intersex people. We don't understand anything. We see pink and blue. We understand what the culture has told us. I could do a whole thing on science that would be incredibly convincing. I'm doing that in the book I'm writing. I've got lots of stuff on science, because I realize that it's not just the scripture that got us here. It's all this other stuff. So however I can get to somebody's reasoning, if they've got reasoning skills, however I can get there, I will go in and try to get it. So, and it's the same thing. When you, if you're going to join us at Pride, look at people with the eyes of Jesus too. You have no idea where they've been. I mean, you have some sort of identification about what's going on, but there are interesting people out there. I mean, and there are some of you in here that I know have taken interesting routes to Jesus. You've taken very interesting routes. You get thrown out of your houses, you go and you do the wild stuff for a few years, and you find your way back. But your job is to talk to us. Your job is to talk to them. And um, my greatest struggle in theology, in doing this work, was you. I just didn't know what to do with you. I had no idea what to do with you when I saw the Spirit of God in you. I had no clue. And that's what you've got to do to us. You know, live the most God-appropriate, God-shining, spirit-emanating life you can. And just keep doing it in front of us. Because when we see it, that's the thing we can't deal with. I mean, that's the thing I couldn't deal with. When, I, when that spirit in me resonated with the spirit in you, I didn't know what to do with you. And I had, to, I had to go back and revisit my scriptures. So that was the third way for me, right? Relationship with you and the revisiting of scriptures. So, and I know there are people that are going to watch this from uh, your families or your friends or people that love to hate me on YouTube. They'll find me. And to those people, I just say, you know, listen. When these fabulous, spirit-filled people of God 
start talking to the church. Please listen. We know what we've been told. It's time to listen to your stories. So I am convinced. We were talking about, Eric and I were talking about this on the, on the way over. The next move of God is you. You're the next move of God. And you're the ones that understand grace and mercy and compassion. And you are going to be the ones that rescue the, the desperate church. Desperate church. So once again, I am so humbled that God even trusts me to put me on this stage. Um, I'm, it, it's just every time I get to speak in a gay community, I feel like I'm the one whose life changed because of I got to hang out with you. And so thank you, and I hope you join us at Pride today. Something, oh, so something I do when I go to Pride events all over the country, I get to go. And this came out of just, um, it says, hurt by church, get a straight apology here. And it's on the front and the back so that I can't escape myself. <laughs> so even if I put a backpack on, which I've tried before, you can still see it. So I can't cover the front and back. I've got to cover, carry a baby in a backpack. And um, it's surprising what it's done to people, because people just want to talk. I mean, we found, you know, you found that out. I know that. But they just want to tell you why and how they got thrown out of the churches. They just want somebody to listen. And they just want someone to say, that's not the heart of God. And so what we do is we go out there, and we're going to be out there just talking to people that will talk to us, and even the ones that don't want to talk to us, still talk to them. <laughs> And it's just great not to have, I tell churches, encourage churches all the time, don't put a table between you and them. There's, you know, the less barriers, the better. Just walking up, yes, once again, Nolan the rock star. <laughs> With his, he'd hold the, the band out and he'd like hold it, position it so that somebody could just walk by and throw their hand through it. And then, you know, then Kathy was be the backup. Got the hand through, it's like, hi. <laughs> tag team evangelizing. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing. We're just trying to get uh, this group of people. 84% of them have been raised in the church or with some kind of Christian background, and less than 2% of them are in church. They don't know they have churches they can go to. They don't know places like Open Door exist. And it's especially the kids. They have no clue. We spoke to a lot of kids yesterday. So join us, but be patient. And I uh, hope I get to come back because there's a lot more I've got to say. Oh, we went over. But thank you.